find fascinating about an old ancient Egyptian Navy officer. We're going to find out what he did and why he's so important. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Well, I guess we're all full of good things Stuff today. Stuff to the gills. <laughs> my, little, my little friend here is, sorry, there, there still are turkeys in, you know, we've had our fill. Yeah. <laughs> but what we're going to do is look into the memoirs of a Navy officer from some 3,500 years ago. This was in the middle of the third millennium BC, a long time. This is before King Tut, and so in the very beginning of the same dynasty, Mm. that had important names like uh, King Tut and came before Ramses the Great and some of those. And this might not look to you like an ancient document, but what it is here, uh, I've gone through the hieroglyphic account and I've made an extraction from it, sort of uh, outlined it as it were, so we could go over it easily. And first, let us please take a look at this. This is an extract from the document in the hieroglyphics. You don't get any punctuation, you don't have any um, capital letters to help you or anything like that. You're on your own. And uh, when we come, well, I'll just give you a little hint. In the top row there, you see from the, the toward the right, you find one that's like sort of a table and it has three circles under it. If you find that up there, you, that means gold. That is the word nub where Nubia gets its name. Uh, so later on, we'll be referring to this important thing uh, again several times. Now, this document was, of course, originally written on papyrus, um, possibly by the person himself, possibly by a scribe. Everybody wasn't literate in hieroglyphics in those days. But <clears throat> he could not have come along at a better time in history to make a big career. Everything just clicked for him to really, really do well in it. It's, we start out here, and he, he has a little kind of teaser. He says, my achievements are, and this is put into the language of the day, more or less, uh, my achievements, seven awards of gold, plus captives and many large land holdings. May the memory of brave deeds last forever in this land. <laughs> So he's telling you right there, he's a brave one, he's done great things. He's a big man on campus. A big man on <laughs> campus. And he's achieved all kinds of things for which he was richly rewarded. Uh, and now, just a couple of brief words. In, in the long range of Egyptian history, of course, uh, they had gotten started maybe a thousand years before then already. But when, when he t starts telling you what's going on, uh, it's in a situation where Egypt has been partly occupied, kind of semi-occupied, by some people known as the Hyksos, and we'll talk about them later, who cleared, cleaned up all over the Near East there for a while. Uh, and this is what gave him the chance as a Navy officer. And we'll see now, he starts out in the actual information. He was born in the city of Neheb, which is fairly far south on the Nile in the upland, not too far from where the cataracts begin. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was the son, well, it's uh, south of Thebes a good bit. Thebes was still the capital in those days, uh, 50 miles or something like that, south of it. Um, he was the son of another Navy officer. He says, my father was Baba, son of Rayant, a Navy captain under King Sekinen Ra, who was the late king. He's gone now, somebody else is king. I made captain, and I was my father's deputy, says here, on the ship Bull, ship with the name Bull, which we could possibly translate as Wild Bull or something. Mm -hmm. They know they went for that sort of thing then. Um, under King Ahmosis, and King Ahmosis was um, a live wire, and he was the first, well, his father really, Sekhen Enra, was the first one to start resisting these invaders in the north. But then it was carried on. And this one really began to, to uh, do things with it. Now, he says, I made captain one of my father's deputy, um, and I was still very young and unmarried at this time. So he's, he's an a up-and-coming, ambitious guy. And he uses this nice phrase and still 
sleeping in the hammock of work. Oh. So this, we would assume, would mean something like he, they apparently slept in hammocks in those days, mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. uh, that he was uh, still on, on sea duty, on, ship, uh, on board ship duty. Mm -hmm. uh, now he says, I later, I later did get a house. I got myself transferred to a ship serving in the north. Let's take a look at present time now of some more of these pictures we have here. Picture number one, well, picture number one would actually be a map to show you where we are. And then we'll look at some of these ships. The picture above that is just a map. And it will, it will show you. The Egyptian empire was not so big at that time as it later became. But this kind of sloshing yellowish brown represents what happened later on. But you see then, you can see the Nile going down there. And he was, he came from a town fairly far in the south. But <clears throat> the Nile was, was the lifeblood of Egypt because not only did its flooding replenish the soil every year, it would flood every year, bring down good soil from the Central African mountains, and then recede, and then you could plant and grow these wonderful crops. But you see also how important it is his father was a Navy officer. Presumably, he was raised with full knowledge of navigating on the Nile, a very important thing. And as the empire grew, it became even more important. So when he was transferred to the north, does that maybe into the Mediterranean or just the northern part of the Nile? Well, and that's a good segue into what comes next here, because he, he wangled it, which he probably could have done very easily, you know, with the, with the pull because what was going on, Pharaoh, Second, and Ray had already started resisting. The enemy was on, see, on top there and occupying the delta and sort of holding a heavy hand on the rest of it. So he had some pull through his father, no doubt, and he wanted to get into the action. So he did. And as it turns out, he seems to have been in some unit that uh, served Pharaoh particularly permanently because he, was, uh, he knows him. Well, he'll be referring to him again later. But with using this influence, he gets up there. Uh, now, if we can look, please, at the next picture, we'll see. Oh, well, all right, we can take this one next. Uh, these two people represent two of the Hyksos, who are also called the Asiatics. And the Egyptians tended to get one, one set method of representing these different nationalities. Mm -hmm. And this was the one for this uh, near Asia, the Levant, the exact area that is so hot and going up in flames now with all these terrible things happening between there and Mesopotamia. So here they are. They have uh, dark, smoothish hair, and they have little beards. The Egyptians they didn't have whiskers, but you see, and they also tended to wear uh, colorful clothing. Uh, the next picture shows two of them again. These were two, apparently, sort of courtier types. And these pictures, they, these people had come into the delta of Egypt. Uh, a few scholars think it was a sudden invasion, violent all over the Near East. More of them tend to think that they filtered in. They were just kind of migrating. They were merchants and so on. One way or another, so there got to be so many of them that they took over. The balance of power shifted onto them. And they were very good fighters. They were innovators. It was the uh, Hyksos who brought the chariot mm -hmm. to Egypt and to the Hittites later. They picked it up from there. Um, they also did a lot in metallurgy. Their weapons were good. Uh, in other words, they were not just a bunch of sort of, sort of dumb beasts moving in there. Uh, and they, they were occupying, and they had. Uh, the estimates vary from 200 to 500 years that they mm -hmm. had been controlling Egypt were not actually occupying all of it. But they penetrated clear down the Nile, or up the Nile, I should say, to the uh, cataracts. They were very, very important people. So here's where the action is. Now, Second and Ray, our hero, whose name was the same as the Pharaoh's name, was also, he was named not after him, but you know the way today, uh, ordinary people have the same names as, mm -hmm. as the bigwigs. Yes. So mm, he uh, get, gets this assignment in the north, board a good ship, and he knows he's going to be working with and for Pharaoh directly. Uh, 
uh, which is indeed what happens. Let us look at the next picture, please. And here is a, a group of the people. The tiny thing in, in the corner there is some Egyptian writing, so you know that this was an Egyptian picture. And you see again that they pretty well knew their enemy. These were people who had uh, migrated or uh, aggressively migrated, you might say, into the north of the country. These were his enemy. And of course, he was going to know about them already. Uh, he might already have been up there to the territory, who knows, with his father. But the next picture then will show a ship. And this is a smaller one. The military ones, of course, were bigger. But the ships uh, were not, they did not have a keel. They were ingeniously built just with, with planking. Uh, they, and again, an ingenious way of, of making it uh, watertight. But they all had a sail. And if we look at the next picture, we see that the, uh, many of them had oars. Most of them had oars if they had to really propel themselves instead of just being just relying on the wind for sail. So uh, if, if we could see the next one, we could have a, another ship. There we go. And you, you can picture, you see at the bow and at the stern, there was a place where somebody stood, an officer presumably, and the, the one worked the sweep, the rudder, and there, there were banks of oars in the middle, and the other one was uh, the commander of the ship. And one more pic picture to give you an idea of what their ships were like. Uh, this is already one of the bigger ones, but you see what looks like a, a curtain or screen. Some of them had a sort of cabin on them, and others had this means of, of making part of the ship private without actually having to hem it in. And of course, it was hot weather most of the time. And you did want protection from rain, but they didn't get much of that. So this was the kind of vessel they'd be going uh, down the Nile on. Even when you went downstream toward the north, you would still have to use power if you wanted any speed. And if you went upstream, this way you had to really you had to have ships with uh, strong, strong oars and strong input from that. Now, when he got up to the north, let's see. Uh, all right, I had got myself transferred to a ship serving in the north. In order to follow His Majesty and fight on foot preceding his chariot. And I didn't transfer this to being his personal bodyguard unit or whatever, because it wasn't only that. But you see, the, the uh, fellow knows that, that they're fighting up there. He knows Pharaoh is up there. So he gets himself assigned to a ship going to the north, reports into His Majesty, the Pharaoh, who always has his honorary title after him, life, health, prosperity, uh, and fight on foot. And this is an important thing about the Navy. They didn't just stay on board ship. Part of their job was to get off and fight. So they were sort of like Marines as well mm -hmm. uh, as Navy officers. And some of them apparently were very good. And this, you see, the uh, Majesty would go into battle in a chariot. And earlier on, they had kind of avoided the Delta because the uh, Ixos were so good at chariots oh, and chariot okay. fighting. But then the Egyptians got good at it, too, and they bred better horses. They didn't even have the horse prior to this thing. Mm. So the invasion did a lot of good. Um, but now he ports into Pharaoh. Pharaoh digs in to besiege the capital city, which was Avaris, an ancient city. Later on, the same grounds were used by other pharaohs for important things. And this was Avaris, which the Egyptians called Hetwart. I fought on foot ahead of him. I did well, and I was promoted. So he is in some sort of an advance guard, but directly in front of the, of the pharaoh. Uh, now, when his majesty had advanced and was fighting in the channel around the city, remember this is a delta, and there are a lot of channels, mm -hmm. streams, and, and big size, large sized things from the Nile. I fought on foot ahead of him, um, did well, he, he advanced. And he was fighting in the channel. I captured booty. This is the first time he mentions it, except in his introduction and his brag. I captured booty, and I brought one hand to his majesty. Ooh. <laughs> that is the way they kept track of uh -huh. casualties. 
like the, the, you, like the Indian scalp. Sort of, uh -huh. yes. And, and we're in World War I, in fact, uh, you had to confirm your, your kill. You couldn't just say, I did this and I did that. I mean, I guess all the time when it was possible. But he brought it, he brought it one hand and cited. This means sort of, I guess it appears in the order of the day or something. He was, he was cited anyway. There was a herald attached to every unit with one or more scribes. So uh, he gave me the gold for bravery. And this is one that puzzled us a little bit. Well, it turns out, as you might expect, it was things like uh, gold bracelets, you mm -hmm. know, and at one time they wore these things on their arm right. as a demonstration of their wealth. But uh, we'll let this go on a little more, and then we'll spring the real, the real delightful thing about the gold <laughs> rewards. Um, and this is the first time he mentions getting the gold here. And the, the engagement went on. He said, I captured more booty. I brought him another hand and was again awarded gold. So he must have been some kind of fighter. He must have been. Twice in the same large engagement. Now, the action moved to the south. He said, when His Majesty was fighting in Takhmet, south of Avaris, I brought in a live captive. I dragged him from the water. His Majesty rewarded me again with the gold. Avaris fell. They captured the city. And I brought in four captives this time and did a lot of looting. This time he had one woman and three men, which His Majesty gave me. Oh. <laughs> so you so could give people. He now had slaves. He had slaves, yeah. Some he would probably sent home. He undoubtedly married after he acquired the house. He undoubtedly married, he had a household, and he could send these slaves back home. Now, there, there was a, a total victory over these folks, in uh, these Hyksos in Avaris. Not only that, but they drove them out, and they drove them back eastward around the edge of the Mediterranean and up into Palestine, which is now Palestine, and they besieged their, their main city there which is remnant, well, uh, there's still a city in that spot, but of course it's not the same. It took them several years to do it, and undoubtedly Pharaoh went back to Thebes. But our naval officer was at least in at the kill, because at the siege of Sharhan, I brought in two women captives in one hand. I was awarded the gold again, plus the two captives. So imagine being Navy officer <laughs> and sort of, who knows what, what their pay was, but it, it reminds you a little bit of the Jane Austen period. You know, in literature, people make their fortune. You went to sea, and you, you did as well as you could. You became a sea captain, and then any time you captured a ship, that was a prize. Mm -hmm. And it was put into shares and divided up amongst the crew. The crew got some little pittance, and the captain got you know enough to make him wealthy. Mm -hmm. So this is nothing, nothing new in our times, but this was going on uh, at that time. Um, and all this gold, of course, one wonders where he put it. Maybe he sent it back home, but you'd have to have somebody trustworthy to do Unless that. Unless it was uh, in the line of the gold bracelet type things that he would wear. Yeah. Uh, yes, but they wouldn't, wouldn't have worn them all the time. Uh, now they had, uh, now they turned around. Pharaoh said, We've done, we've cleaned it up up here. Now we're going to go down because the Hyksos had been allied with the Nubians down in the land of gold. The Nubians were great fighters, principally bowmen, and the, the hieroglyphics for them often have a little bow mm -hmm. as a sign in it, you know, of, of what, what it is. Um, His Majesty sailed up the Nile to Nubia after conquering Sharhan, and presumably our uh, officer is the one who commanded the little fleet that would accompany Pharaoh and possibly even Pharaoh's ship because he did have quite a bit of pull. He doesn't, he doesn't go so far as to say that, but he sure is proud of all this, <laughs> of this other stuff. Um, the Hyksos had gotten there trying to add a certain action here when His Majesty captured the king. The king had been down there, actually. The king of the Hittites, or the Hyksos, had been down there. I brought in two captives. And now they're doing 
the shares just the way they did it later in naval operations. And I was awarded five shares with a booty. The out of every hundred, he'd get five, whatever it was, and five measures of land in my city. So one supposes he was planning or, or that it was customary to go back to the city of your origin, because that would be Nechev, you know, 50 miles or something south of Thebes. Country estate. Right. Um, <laughs> Now, all of the Navy men got something, too. And again, this is like the British Navy and other navies mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. uh, in later times, mm -hmm. that the wealth was shared out. And we think things are changed, don't we? <laughs> yeah, you know, there's just nothing new under the sun. Exactly. So he gets five shares of uh, booty. They have another little action, a little rebel thing. As they sail along the Nile, they keep hitting pockets, you know. This, he, he receives three shares of booty and five measures of land. Then the king dies. Pharaoh dies, fullness of time. And his son becomes king. And this was Amenophis, who was known to us mostly as Djoser, I think. Uh, he went upriver again. Now, in, in the meantime, I think that our hero must have gone back to Thebes, touched base, or gone back to Nehia, because now... We have the new pharaoh going upriver to Nubia once again to expand Egypt and wipe out some more rebels. And up he goes with pharaoh, and they get off the ship, and they fight, just like sort of a combination of navy. They know all about sailing. Of course, there was a lot less to know in those days. But yeah. even so, uh, they're up there. I, I fought well, and the king saw me. <laughs> and this is a new king for him, Djoser. Uh -huh. The king saw me in action. I brought in one captive and two hands. Now I took him from these upper upper waters down by the the um, cataract of the Nile. Pharaoh, I guess, considered the work done. He wanted to go back to Egypt, and he got him back to Thebes in two days. And even going downstream, that seems impossible, because of the distance from from Thebes. Well, the distance from Thebes up to there would, would have been oh, a couple hundred miles at the, mm, the very least. Two days. That would because be. it's, it's 300 and some miles up to where Cairo is mm -hmm. now from down there. So, uh, and for this I was awarded the gold. <laughs> he never came, he says again, again, again. He said, for this I was awarded the gold. I brought in two more female captives, and I was awarded warrior of the ruler, sort of the king's own. Mm -hmm. And while we see this on the screen, please keep this here. What do they look like to you? They look like moths. <laughs> well, flies. <laughs> flies. They are flies. And the golden fly, of course, they had lots of gold. Just coming out of Nubia, they had extra gold. But you can see how nicely made they are. And look at the body of the fly. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You can see it's put together beautifully. And this was probably one of the most... Uh, I think it might have been a little higher as a, as a decoration mm -hmm. than just the bracelets and things. But every time he says he was awarded the gold, you wonder, I, remember, I wonder now if it was more flies mm -hmm. and what you could do with them. Well, you could melt them down and have things made, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't have to put them in a bank anywhere. But um, so he's become warrior of the ruler, and that's a you know, pretty, pretty high one. And one thinks, for instance, of the, of the Br British. Uh, the Queen's Own, the King's Own, mm -hmm. some regiment, mm -hmm. and who knows, maybe the, maybe the whole unit was honored with it. But he became warrior of the king. Now, this, this pharaoh uh, did not live terribly long either. Uh, I think he uh, something like 10 years. But the, the one after that was the first of the Thutmosis pharaohs. Mm. And he was a hellraiser. A lot of this was repeated because it says here, I conveyed King Thutmosis, he became Thutmosis the first, of course, to Hent and Nefer to destroy the rebels. And they were Nubian bowmen. So again, he's been back to Thebes, apparently, or his hometown. Down they went again. Traffic on the Nile was a huge thing. And I think probably still has its import and, and the flooding, uh, although it's controlled now, of course, much more than it was then. Then, 
action changes, and our, our hero doesn't say, we went back to the north and what he did, but he says, I fought with him in the foul waters of the, and the manuscript is damaged at that point. Oh, no. And you don't know. <laughs> you don't know so where he was fighting. Was <laughs> but he was fighting, uh, and again, with his majesty. So he's in this crack unit, you know, whatever it is. And I think it might possibly be in the north, back to the north again, because uh, thought Moses was known for mopping up in the south and leaving a few little settlements here and there. And they were, uh, for a while, uh, permanently uh, no danger. So he said, now, aha, our empire up in the north has been pretty well uh, undermined by the Hyksos and then by others in the area. Mm -hmm. So back they went, down the Nile, post-haste. Mm -hmm. And what, what does he say here? Um, went directly back north and after thoroughly defeating the Nubians. And we know now that, that he, uh, our, our hero does mention an area. It indicates that he got beyond the Euphrates River, so beyond where uh, Iraq now is. Mm -hmm. But that whole area, it really makes you think that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Right. Because the exact area where the worst of this fighting was going on was northern Iraq, what is now northern Iraq, what was eastern Turkey, and northeastern Syria. That's exactly. Just an area that has always been it's in always unrest. Been, and mm -hmm. in between, even in, in the ancient days, mm -hmm. uh, you had trouble up there and People just seemed to couldn't couldn't rest. The Hittite led around the Hittites and the Egyptians were the big powers, and then Mitanni got in there. It, it took a strong pharaoh, but this that Moses the first was a very strong pharaoh, mm -hmm. uh, and apparently had been well trained in the military. He he was uh, he was no no navy officer, although he had to have navy to take him part way, mm -hmm. and then we're almost go to the end. Oh, we're almost out. Uh, I would like to look, uh, we have a picture in there that talks about the sailors. It's a stone carving and it's a little little gray thing. There we are. This represents a crew of a ship. I don't know what ship, whose ship. Um, the troops as well as the pharaohs wore sort of kilt as a rule. So it's interesting here that they seem to be wearing a sort of bloomers, but they're, uh, wh whether they're a kilt of a strange form or whether it's something in front of it, it might be something protective, but how they'd be holding it on, you know, who knows. But this is very interesting and very well done, as you can see. Mm -hmm. I mean, 3,500 years ago, they, they knew how to carve stone right. in that area. Uh, if we look at the next picture, this is a total jumble, and it's supposed to be because in one of these naval battles, I think you can faintly see the ships. And again, they're, they're smallish, so you could maneuver around, like fighter planes, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you see them just, just having at it with each other. And another picture will show us, these are troops on land, whether they're trained ground troops or whether these are some of the ones that get off the ship as naval personnel and then become fighters. But they would, of course, be conveyed by ship. But you see they have shields, a lot of them with uh, ox hide. And now, this is not, a, of course, a true picture of them, but this is probably one of those little ushabti they put in the graves of important people. Mm -hmm. These would defend them in the, in the other world. Right. And they were exact replicas uh, in there. There's a whole brewery, for instance, how they made beer, exactly with these little tiny figures doing it. But you see they were armed with spears, they had bladed instruments, uh, but not, not big swords, but bladed instruments. They had uh, the chariot. And now these people, of course, uh, others would be trained to drive the chariots, and others would be trained to shoot from the chariots. Okay, we've got to quit. We've got to quit. We've got to quit. All right, well, we've seen almost all the nice pictures I wanted to show. <laughs> and I think we've conveyed an idea that all that time ago, um, here's this naval officer making his career, you know, and uh, the golden flies just clustered around him later, or the right. equivalent. 
and what, what it was like to be a Navy officer then, and to get promoted, to get influence, mm -hmm. wear the gold braid on your uh, shoulder, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, and so. I'm not sure times have changed all that much. <laughs> <laughs> One wonders.